I call on the Catholic chaplain to lead us in the opening prayer. Shall we please remain standing? Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Almighty and ever-living God, we are so much grateful to you for the gift of our lives. We thank you for this day, this moment, and we thank you for the gift of our lives and for gathering us today for this public lecture. We thank you for the gift of Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. We thank you for making this our institution the place of quality education. We thank you for the management, staff, and students of this university. We thank you for all that you use us to accomplish in the life of humanity. And we also thank you for the gift and life of this public lecture planning committee. And we thank you for the effort that have gone into it to make it a reality for us in our lives. We thank you for our resource person. We thank you for Jenny Mercies and for inspiring her with your wisdom and intelligence. It's our prayer that you continue to use her to inspire us with a thought-provoking reflection on our lives. We entrust this entire public lecture to your care. Be with us, guide us, and inspire us with your spirit. And make all that we do here be a source of blessings and favors upon us. We ask all these blessings through Christ our Lord. Amen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are once again welcome to the Great Hall of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, the globally acclaimed university in terms of quality teaching. Shall we please applaud KNUST? <laughs> we are here for yet an exciting opportunity to listen to a distinguished speaker in our public lecture series put together by the Public Lecture Committee of KNUST. A distinguished academic from one of the best universities in the world will be delivering a lecture on the student at the heart of university education reflections from Chancellor Melissa Nobles of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, USA. Our distinguished chancellor will take us on a journey that will leave us with lasting reflections. It is my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce our chairperson for today's occasion and other dignitaries who are here to grace this great occasion. Our chairperson is already known to us. She talked several firsts in her academic life and has risen to be the first female vice chancellor of KNUSC. Ladies and gentlemen, please applaud our vice chancellor, Professor Mrs. Rita Akosia Dixon. <laughs> Other dignitaries gracing the occasion today are the registrar of the university. Please applaud Mr. Andrew Squesi Buati. Chairperson and members of the Public Lecture Committee of KNUST, of course, chaired by Professor Mrs. Atinuke Adebanji. The Director of Student Affairs, Professor Wilson Ejari, thank you for coming. As the program progresses, I will be introducing dignitaries who join. I now invite our chairperson for her opening remarks. Please applaud the Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much, uh, moderator, pro vice chancellor, registrar, our distinguished lecturer, Chancellor Melissa Nobles, provost of colleges, deans and directors, heads of departments, members of convocation, senior and junior staff of our great university the clergy, 
proud alumni of the university. My dear students, our friends from the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all. I said good afternoon. Thank you. I am extremely delighted to be chairing this public lecture to be delivered by our august visitor, the Chancellor of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, USA, Professor Melissa Nobles. We are indeed honored to welcome you, Chancellor, into our midst, and all of you who have come for this program to the best university in Ghana, and I like to take my time and emphasize that. And the number one destination for quality education globally, per the Times Higher Education Rankings 2023. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our distinguished guest will be sharing her reflections on a topic that is very dear to my heart, and most certainly that of all of us here, the student at the heart of university education. How are we able, as higher education institutions, to provide the needed environment and support to ensure the absolute success of our students who are in the center of what we do. Indeed, without our students, there will be no higher education institutions. Our students, as you would agree with me, constitute our number one clients, making this lecture very, very, very important. This evening, Chancellor Nobles will be very kind to take us on a journey of how we can help the students at the heart of a 21st century university education to develop into their whole selves and set them on a path to becoming the people they want to be. She will discuss how MIT and other institutions of higher learning can advance what she refers to as a whole student education. She will lay emphasis on why we need to focus on strategies and investments inside and outside of the classroom that support students' academic success, cultivate their personal and intellectual growth, and foster their sense of community and well-being. She will throw more light on the need for educators to help the next generation of innovators and problem solvers apply all their passion and intellect to discovering, advancing knowledge, and leading while embracing personal and professional lives that are rich in meaning in their developmental journeys. Indeed, as universities, we have the future in our hands. This is because tertiary institutions are more than just centers for academic instruction. They are a vital part of our society that shape the minds of future generations. It is therefore clear that for us to bring about transformation in our societies, we must pay attention to our students in a very special way. This evening, we would be privileged, as I've said, to have Chancellor Noble speak to the subject of the student-centric model. Such a model would necessitate robust support systems, including academic, psychological, career counseling services, and all 
other support systems that ensures student success at the end of the day. Faculty should not only serve as instructors, but also continue to serve as mentors and academic tutors who guide students in their academic journey and beyond. For us at KNUST, this means a lot to us. With a passion and drive for providing an all-inclusive education for our students, where diversity of thought and respect for human dignity is always upheld, we continue to be very keen about the many students we can include and we must include rather than exclude as we provide these opportunities and unique experiences for students. The student must and should continue to be at the center of all that we do. By putting the student at the heart of the university education, we can create a more enriching, engaging, and inclusive learning environment for our students to succeed. This approach will not only improve the quality of education, but will also better prepare our students who are the future leaders for life beyond the university walls. That is why we must all count ourselves as blessed to be part of this evening's program, where Chancellor Nobles of MIT will share with us her rich experiences and give us a ride through all that there is to know about the student at the heart of university education. For us as tertiary institutions to improve on what we do. This, I believe, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, will assist us to continue to keep the charge that we have as we train these agents of change. With these few words, I'd just like to encourage you to relax and just take it all in. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would want to use this opportunity to quickly acknowledge some provosts who have joined us. I would want to acknowledge the presence of the provosts of the College of Engineering, Professor Brichum Nyakon. Thank you for coming. Also here is the provost of the College of Health Sciences, Professor Christian Ejari. Thank you for coming. So Ejako Onimo will give us a musical interlude.
Thank you very much, Eja Kuonimo. A louder round of applause to Eja Kuonimo because the prelude, the prelude to his song had to do with a 90-year-old man, and interestingly, he is over 90, so I assume he's singing about himself. To introduce our speaker today, ladies and gentlemen, shall we please welcome the chairperson for the Public Lecture Committee, Professor Mrs. Atinuke Adibanji. Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for today. Professor Melissa Nobles is an American political scientist and academic administrator. She is currently the chancellor and the class of 1922 professor of political science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Before being appointed chancellor in 2021, she served as the Kenan Sahin 
Dean of the School of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, as well as the head of the Department of Political Science. Chancellor Nobles graduated from Brown University with a degree in history and received an MBA and PhD in political science from Yale University. She has held fellowships at Boston University's Institute for Race and Social Division and Harvard University's Radcliffe Center for Advanced Study. She has also served on the editorial boards of Polity, American Political Science Review, Perspectives in Politics, as well as a guest editor for a special issue of Nature. As the Chancellor, Professor Melissa Nobles is responsible for overseeing more than 60 interconnected offices at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology that deliver a whole student education by supporting undergraduate and graduate students' academic success, fostering community and well-being, and cultivating personal and intellectual growth. Reporting to the president, the chancellor, and the provost are the Institute's two most senior academic officers. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Chancellor Nobles has been a member of the MIT faculty since 1995. Throughout her distinguished career at MIT, Chancellor Nobles' leadership has resulted in the creation of a new theater building and a forthcoming music building, which will be a state-of-the-art center for music research, innovation, and performance. She also championed the pioneering MIT and slavery research class, secured new support for graduate students, postdocs, and professorships at the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, and launched several labs that are focused on digital humanities, music technology, election data, science, and climate action. Chancellor Nobles has also been involved in faculty governance at MIT and beyond. She served as associate chair of the MIT faculty from 2007 to 2009 and vice president of the American Political Science Association. Chancellor Nobles' teaching include graduate courses in transitional justice, ethnic politics, and nationalism, as well as undergraduate courses in comparative politics, Latin American studies, ethnic conflict in world politics, and social movements in comparative perspective. Our international comparative research focuses on restorative justice in light of ethnic and racial conflicts. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, could you please stand up and give a round of applause as we welcome our other speaker, <laughs> Professor Melissa Nobles, the Chancellor of MIT. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Please be seated. Thank you. It is such a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Thank you very much for this warm Ghanaian welcome. I feel very much at home here today. So I thank you, <laughs> um, uh, Madam Vice Chancellor, as well as all of the many distinguished guests in the audience. And of course, welcome to the students, since that's what I'm going to be talking a lot about. I have to put on these glasses now. <laughs> So I'm happy to join you this afternoon to say a bit about my thoughts about what I describe as the whole student education. And as been said, in certain ways, your, the Madam Vice Chancellor said a lot of things that I intended to say, so I think uh, great institutions think alike. That is, students have to be at the center of what it is that we do. Not only the faculty, as important as the faculty are, of course, because they are sharing that knowledge, but at the end of the day, the students or why we are all here. So in my talk today, I'll say a bit about the larger context of higher education 
before speaking a bit about the whole, education, whole student education and what that means at MIT. But I should say that what I'm going to say applies not only to MIT, in fact, I think much of it applies here at your university, and it sounds as if you are doing many of the things that we are already doing at MIT. So let me say a little bit about the importance of higher education. You know, there is little doubt about the importance of education for national and global progress. Indeed, the future of humanity rests crucially on our collective ability to harness knowledge and to put it to good use. And that is especially true for students in science and technology. So as a first point, higher education is absolutely fundamental to human progress. I think we all know that, but it often bears repeating. And it's also true that although that higher education itself depends upon the fundamentals provided by excellent primary and secondary education. That is true all across the globe. In any country where there is substantial progress, you see a very strong educational system. Moreover, as we know, universities are engines of immense collective and individual opportunities to innovate. Universities are interesting, as we know, because they're interesting places, because on the one hand, we learn about what we know before, right? That is, universities are built upon knowledge. And at the same time, in order to progress, it sometimes means that you reject what you learned in order to push the boundaries to learn something new. So at their best, universities are bold and they are forward looking. And this is the context into which I think our students enter. So the question is, for universities, what is our responsibility to our students? Our job, I think, is to prepare them to invent the future. Sounds obvious. We all say children are the future, our children are the future. We sometimes don't act that way. So the job is to prepare our students to invent the future. And it is also to prepare them to lead, to lead their cities to lead their countries to lead the world and whichever way that they are leading that is wherever where our students find themselves we have to teach them how to do that a big part of that is making sure that they can think for themselves that they think critically that they be intellectually curious that they learn well the fundamentals of their disciplines, and that they have a curiosity about other disciplines because knowledge in the 21st century is multidisciplinary. It's not enough to know one thing, you have to know many things, and oftentimes you have to know many things well. The point is to push the boundaries of disciplines. And we also need creative thinkers. Since creative thinking is absolutely necessary to address today's challenges in our respective countries, in the US and in Ghana, and around the world. So intellectual development, of course, is a fundamental responsibility of higher education. But it is not the only responsibility. The other is personal development for students, as well as a commitment to building communities and participating with others towards a common purpose. So this vision of the whole student I'm going to describe shapes the education of students at MIT. But as I said, the whole student education is not limited to MIT. Indeed, it recognizes that students learn best when they are fully engaged in the learning process, that they are not passive learners, they are not passive listeners. They ask questions, they critique others, and they are comfortable with being critiqued. They discover their own interests, and they pursue them. And they look for solutions to problems about which they are concerned. And they just may want to learn, or they may just want to write, or they want to be artists. Whatever it is, they pursue a passion. I just want to say, I was last week or two weeks ago, actually, I was in Accra. I was here with my husband, and I went to the Gallery 1957, which is a great art gallery, it has a, it's in one of the hotels there, but it's also a gallery in London. And I saw several works of former students from this university. World-class artists. 
So it's not only is, is this university creating world-class technologists and scientists and has the ambitions for that, but also world-class artists. And that shows the importance of the arts, that students may be interested in science technology, but they typically have other interests, and those interests are as important. I should say this, I'm a social scientist and political scientist. I don't know too many people who can go in the world without knowing a bit about politics. So the whole student vision and thinks about the students learn how to make things, just do things. There may not be things that end up being very important, except that they're learning, to, they're learning the, uh, uh, the skills and the knowledge that they have in engineering, for example, in science. They're actually learning it and putting it to work in, on their own. So the idea is to develop curiosity. So maker spaces are crucially important, and we find that those kind of activities which happen outside of the classroom are as important as what happens inside the classroom because it makes what's happening in the classroom real, makes it a bit more relevant. Bringing what's happening in the classroom out into the world is something that I think students find important and engaging, and it makes what they're learning seem relevant because it's perfectly reasonable to ask, why am I learning this? And it seems we should have an answer to those questions. The second is to think about cultivating intellectual and personal growth. In a certain way, having academic success is a part of intellectual growth. But also, part of succeeding is being intellectually curious. It's perhaps having an interest when you come into the university and figuring out that I really like this subject better or I like other things as much as I like doing this. We ought to encourage students to, as much as we can, to pursue their various interests. We also think it's very important for students to form and run their own organizations. So at MIT, there are over 600 student organizations on campus. There's a lot of organizations, 600, lots of students, but they run them themselves. And the point of allowing them to run their own organizations is that they learn how to lead, they learn how to self-organize, they learn how to self-govern, and they learn how to collaborate and work with each other. Learning these skills, as all of us know who are out in the world, is, is as important as what you know is how do you work with people. And that's a skill that being in student organizations can cultivate. I should also add that these organizations are various sizes and they cover all kinds of subjects. Some students are concerned about climate change, others are really interested in theater, others are interested in chess. Whatever it is, we have student organizations which allow them to do what it is that they want to do. And finally, there is an effort to cultivate community and well-being between the student organizations and dorms, and that is where students live on campus and many students live off campus, there are places where students come and they learn to live with one another. Oftentimes students are thrown together in dorms, they don't know anybody. They don't know, you know, and many students are coming from other parts of the United States and also from around the world. So the idea is to get students to learn how to live with people who they don't know and to learn how to be respectful and inclusive. All of those things, you can say it as much as we want to, and we certainly know it's important. It's an important part of the ethos at this institution. It's an important ethos at MIT. It's one thing to say it, it's another thing to live it. And living in dorms is one way that our students learn to put their values into practice. So I want to say a bit about the view about MIT students, and I think it may go a bit for students here. At a, and it has to do with being at a school of science and technology. And I say this as a social scientist. So there's a view that MIT students are really only a concern about science and technology. That's why they apply, that's why they went there, that's what they want to learn. And that they don't care about anything else besides STEM. And it's certainly true that many students are interested or deeply interested in STEM classes, but they all have other interests. And I think it is crucially important that we cultivate these other interests in students. And why? And that is because, especially now in the 21st century, that this is a story for 20th century, 21st century education. We all know how important human, we all know how important technology is. Every single one of us, for example, in here has a phone. You, some of you may be looking at it now. 
<laughs> I know I was right on that. Phones have changed our lives. That little bit of technology all over the world, no matter where you go, is the phone in the earbuds. And it's changing how we live, how we interact with one another. I've been in restaurants here. I've been in the United States. No one is talking to each other. They're all on the phone. It's changing how humans interact. That's kind of minor, right? We can say, OK, that's Melissa. OK, that's great for Chancellor Nobles. So what people are talking at dinner. But there are many other dimensions of technology that aren't so harmless, that have real implications for how we think about human life now and going forward. What we're seeing today is nothing like what the world is going to look like in 10 or 20 years. One of the advantages of being at MIT in a certain way is that I get to see the future, because a lot of things that are happening haven't been seen yet, but I get a chance to see it by looking at what our faculty are researching. Some of it is incredibly promising. Some of it can be a little scary. And it is scary in part because when we have to think, and we're thinking about this quite closely, and I'm encouraging you all to do the same, is to think about the ethics and social responsibility of these technologies. So part of a whole student education means not only that we learn about science technology, as important as that is, there is no doubt that what we need to know in the 21st century is rooted in those things. The challenges that we face as a planet, we need scientists and we need technologists, but they cannot do that work alone. They need social scientists, they need ethicists, they need lawyers, they need artists. We need a, a whole student education means also including these disciplines. And I'm encouraged to see that here at, at, at this university, you all have all of those disciplines, and I'm hopeful that they can continue to be, to the degree that there is collaboration, there should be more collaboration, and to the degree that there isn't collaboration, you can start having collaboration. That's important because as part of a whole student education, the students themselves have to see the faculty modeling interdisciplinary research. They have to see faculty who know and understand the political, social, and ethical implications of the work that they do and the consequences. And it may not always be just high technology. It may be very basic things that all human societies need. Clean water, functioning roads, all of those things, electrical grids that are efficient, the kind of research that I heard about earlier today. All of those things are important, and they are not only scientific and technological in nature, they are also social. And you need the social sciences to be a part of that conversation. So at MIT, we think about the whole student. We think about integrating disciplines as well as ensuring that students know deeply about their own disciplines. And that point is, of the whole student, is that students have an understanding of all of their, of all of humanity, right? That they have an understanding of the wholeness of human beings and that they bring that understanding into their studies. So finally, I'll say, and this is true for MIT students, and I know it's true for students here. We want our students to have a big picture approach to their studies and to their future goals. That means that students must be encouraged and allowed to be active participants in their own education and that giving them that space, that freedom to think freely and to push boundaries and to do so responsibly and ethically and for the, for the betterment of humanity is our responsibility in higher education for the 21st century. Thank you very much. Now, I'll, I'll say this. I understand there are going to be questions. I kept it. I was told maybe I should talk a little bit longer. I'm not going to do that. You know why? At MIT, if I talk too long, they say, shut up. <laughs> so I'd rather stop before you tell me to shut up. But rather, and I want to make sure that we have time for me to answer, answer questions. And I'm looking forward to questions from all, students especially, but faculty as well and anyone else. So with that, thank you.
Right, so once again, a loud round of applause for Chancellor Nobles for a great presentation. So this session is going to be quite interactive. It's time now for you to ask your questions and then she would answer them. So we'll take our first set of five questions. She'll come and address and then we we'll take another set. So if you have a question, kindly raise your hand. Let's locate you and then you ask the question. So kindly raise your hand if you have a question. I see a hand over there. Can we take the microphone to the gentleman over there? All right, your name, and then quickly, your question. Okay. I'm Emmanuel Edukun, second year mechanical engineering student. So, Can you speak up, please? Okay, I'm Emmanuel Edukun, second year mechanical engineering student. So I want to know if uh, MIT apply, or is there any way for students, maybe they didn't reach their criteria academically, but technically they are good. Do they apply such students? Um, okay, so I didn't quite get your question, and our speaker also didn't get your question. So if you could hit on it, then we take the second question, please. Please be clearer this time round. Okay, so you leave it there and ask your question. Okay. I'm a mechanical engineer, second year. Yes. I'm Emmanuel Duku. Okay. So my question is, is there any way possible to apply students who academically do not reach the criteria of the school, yet they are technically good? Okay. So, Chancellor, he wants to know... He wants to know if, in the situation where he is not academically good, but technically, you are academically good. Come. Uh, he wants to know. He wants to know. He wants to know if there's a cutoff point or something like that for those who are not maybe uh, don't have the maybe. The, the, the requirement of MIT, but are technically good. Yes, so I, I think that's it. You got a question? Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay, so the second question, please. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Francis Boa Yes. Yes, electrical and electronic student, level 400. I want to ask if MIT do provide a scholarship program for those in engineering program. Then the second one is, uh, as my brother said, as my brother said, the cutoff point, what is the category for the international students? I know some of the scholarship do affect those in the domestic regime, but the international student, uh, we have some category that you need to pass through before you can be given that scholarship. So I want to ask the category for international students who wish to apply to MIT. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. My name is Felix, second year petroleum engineering student. Yes, please, I want to know, back in the university, you graduated with a lot of people in the same rank, going higher in, in the education. So I want to ask, what actually got you to that level? Because there are a lot of people you were in college with, maybe doing your master's, PhD, you all the same thing, 
in the same university, coming up in the same rank. So what made you stood up exceptionally? Is it because of the repertoire of skills or the morals? Please, I want to know that. OK. Um, so just go straight to the question, please. Yes. W without the background. Yes. Like. Yes, please. I want to know what is making MIT stand out. OK. What, yes, he wants to know what makes MIT stand out. Is that all? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Yes, please. And, and the counselor too. And the chancellor too. Yes. Yes. So what's made her stand out and the university stand out as well? Thank you. Okay. So my name is Asamwanda Niokwame Owari, a third year student. And I ask myself, is it the right path to hear or see students day in, day out struggle to move abroad to further or pursue their education? Because I have a good friend of mine who tells me when he's been given the privilege to study in abroad, that is starting from level 100 in abroad, he will leave even if he's in level 400. Did you get that? All right, so, so it's getting serious now. <laughs> I understand why you may have to give a background. But if the background is too long, it, it doesn't bring the question out clearly. So please go straight to the question again for us, please. Yes, you. OK, so the question is, is it? good to hear or see students struggle to move abroad to further or pursue their education? Is it good for students home and abroad to pursue their education? Their yeah. education. Yeah. I mean struggle to move, that is from here, struggle to move abroad to study or pursue their education. Yeah. Okay, so what we'll do is this, Chancellor, for the questions you've taken. Yeah, so we'll, we'll hold on to that one. For the questions you have, kindly address them here for us as we prepare the ground for more questions, yeah? Okay, hold on, folks. <laughs> okay, for the first question that I understood, kind of, Technically good, but not academically sound. Could you apply to MIT? You could certainly apply, you wouldn't get in. Meaning, while it's really important to have technical skills for sure, uh, students who apply to MIT, international students, we have many who apply. Some get in, some don't. But the cutting line for all students is a certain grade point average and a certain score on standardized tests. That is the entrance. So it's just a highly competitive school. Having said that, I hope to get the numbers. We do have students from Ghana who are both undergraduates and graduates. Regarding scholarships, we do have scholarships for international students. International students apply, especially at the postgraduate level. Roughly 50% of MIT graduate students, that is your equivalent of postgraduate, are international. Some get support. Um, from the university, they, they apply for scholarships, international scholarships. Some are supported by their governments. Some are supported by private donors. Others get support from the faculty. If the faculty want them to be a part, one of the students that they apply for, the o that they would like working in their lab. The only way to find out, of course, is to apply. But as you all would expect, um, it is quite competitive. What makes MIT stand out, or was it my personal story? What, there was some desire to know a bit about my personal story. So I was born and raised in New York City. My parents are from the American South, Tennessee, the state of Tennessee and South Carolina. This might not mean anything to you, but of course, some part of my ancestors at one point were slaves and they were freed. 
with the Civil War, of course, and uh, eventually moved to the North where I was born. I went to schools, public schools. I didn't go to any private schools. My parents were plain workers. My father was a police officer and my mother was a social worker. My mother died quite young at the age of 34 when I was 10 years old. So I was raised by my father and my brother, and my, my brother's a year younger than me, and eventually my father remarried. So I know a lot about loss, and I know a lot about parents having to make do. I went to, I did pretty well in high school, and I went to college, I went to Brown University, and I worked, then I worked when I graduated from college because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I worked for three years and then I went, applied to graduate school and I went to graduate school at Yale University. Then I got a job at MIT. My brother also went to school. He went to uh, uh, State University of New York as an undergraduate. Then he got a master's degree from New York University and he went to Harvard Law School where he was a classmate of President Barack Obama. They were friends. And, but once Barack became the president, well, you know, that ended. <laughs> no, actually, my brother, he wouldn't mind my saying this, was invited to the, um, when Obama won, um, he was invited to Chicago to be a part of when Obama made the announcement. So we, but we started off not, we are not wealthy people or anything like that. We were happy, we were lucky in a certain way that our parents really uh, emphasized education. And my father, even when my mother died, made sure that we stayed in school. So that's why I'm such an import, I'm such a believer in education. Okay, Chancellor, be, before we go for our next set of questions, I've gotten one question from you from, from the students. The question was, is it worth it for students to do everything possible, to struggle to come over to MIT for education? Is it worth it? Yes. <laughs> Let me say why. <laughs> but look, I want to say this. As important as MIT is, you have a fine institution here. And, and in an important, MIT wasn't always the school that it is today. It started out as a small school right after the Civil War, so this would have been 1865 when it was founded. And it uh, was a small school that it, over time grew. And it's gotten the reputation that it has now, of course. I raise that to say, MIT wasn't always MIT. It was something before that, right? Meaning that it was built by the people who were a part of it, by the faculty, by the administrators, and the students. And everyone has a role to play. So you have a fine institution here. I know the administrators want to make it better, and they need the support of everyone in the room, as well as uh, the powers that be in Accra. Thank you. So we'll go for our next set of questions. So please go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. My name is Alexander. I'm a teaching and research assistant with the computer engineering department. Um, I have three questions. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you prioritize them. Come again. <laughs> um, so question number one. All right. So. Um, the first question is, with the U.S. Supreme Court's ruling on diversity, how is that going to affect the next batch of admissions? Because we want to keep our institutions diversified. So how are we going to make sure that our institutions are diversified and follow the law? And then um, with the second question, um, based off the lecture that you just gave, um, cross-disciplinary research is very important. Um, like you said, the social scientists need to keep the... Um, the IT and technology guys in check. So how do we go about that without stifling innovation? Because um, social scientists can be overly uh, <laughs> protective of the people, right? But science sometimes needs to destroy before we can 
um, gets okay. to something, right? And then the yeah. last one is um, with regard to introducing social scientists to technology. So many social scientists believe that technology is not a crucial aspect for their work. But with the way that the world is revolutionizing, it seems that there's an importance or there's a need to introduce them to technology. So how do we get over those prejudices and then introduce that into the system? Thank you. All right, gentlemen, please go ahead. From, oh, sorry. Please, from your lecture, you said that as technological students, we should be able to develop our artistic sites. And I'm a final year doctor of pharmacy student. As a student in the technological and science part, how do I develop my artistic side on my own? Thank you. Um, my name is Kojo Nyama. My name is Kojo Nyama. I read BA English, level 200. Um, it's not coincidental that today um, the public lecture was more or less given by a professor of social sciences. My question has more or less a base upon the previous two, the two previous um, person who asked the question. Now, the question is that in this 21st century where there is this technological advancement and the fast paced level of AIs and all that, we feel that those people in the social sciences are more or less left to the gallows. Why? Because we normally give credence to technology, let's say STEM programs, as opposed to the social sciences um, programs. In your, in your lecture, I think you talked about how um, social sciences can more or less imbibe technology in their works. But my question is that in this 21st century, I didn't hear a practical or a key practical way of social sciences incorporating all these um, technological um, changes in their work so that we can help or more or less be relevant or stay relevant in this century. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, good afternoon. Please, you stated that you have, you, you stated the emphasis you have on education and I, um, personally I also have an emphasis, I, I have very much of an interest in that. And I wanted to ask if something like something with regards to learning and reading among children, if I want to channel that and combine that with the technology, because I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself, I'm a research assistant for food science and technology. So if I want to com combine that with what I do, my interest, how, how can you advise that I do something like that? Combine reading? Um, learning, education in children with something with regards to the course I do or with regards to science and technology in general. Okay, so we'll go for our last question in this batch, please. All right. Um, my name is Nyamiasem Inogjijom, and then uh, I'm a fourth year meteorology and climate science student. I want to, uh, I want to ask this question. Um, perhaps you're a student, a uh, final year student at then you want to, uh, you have an innovative idea. Maybe you want to uh, use climate to generate energy or something like that. But then in our world here, there's not enough funds for that. Does MIT have a program or um, something for students like us so that we can write it out and then get support from the school? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Chancellor, so I think we can take your answers for yeah. this batch of questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the first question was about um, the first with three parts, the question, right? 
Uh, one was asking about admissions uh, and diversity in admissions. You're right, the Supreme Court, as you well noted, has made a ruling against taking race into account when thinking about admissions. And all schools now are, are trying to figure out how we're going to keep, our, keep up with our diversity goals. Um, we're working on that at MIT, and nearly all schools at, in, the, in the US are working on that issue. I'm pretty sure that we're going to continue to find a way to do it. We, ha we have to be creative. But the truth is, the US is changing. The demography of the United States is changing. And our universities have to reflect that. So we'll find a way. Uh, regarding, there were two questions about technology and social science, and in fact, it came up in a couple of ways, so I think I'll, hopefully, this answer will address the, the several of the questions that dealt with the issue of the connections between social science and technology. So there seemed to be two, two parts to that question. One was, okay, um, sometimes there are barriers on both sides, I'm going to read it that way, that Tech people want to do tech stuff, and social scientists want to do it their ways, or they're suspicious of tech people. Tech people are suspicious of social scientists. Tech people think social scientists slow them down. Social scientists think that you all aren't careful in what you do, and you make a lot of assumptions that may not hold. But the truth is both of the disciplines need each other. It may not seem that way when you're working on it, of course, because we have narrow questions. I know that each each discipline is trying to answer. And sometimes we don't talk across our different camps. But the problems that many of us want to study require that we learn to talk with one another. So maybe it's one way that we've thought about it at MIT in the United States is when the questions, that, when you're developing your research questions or your research projects, that they be questions that both social scientists are interested in and technology people are interested in, the engineers are interested in. There are going to be some questions that you're not interested in. The engineers aren't going to care about what the social scientists think, and the social scientists aren't going to be concerned about what the engineers think. But there are a set of questions that both groups should be interested in. Find those questions and work on it. But don't. I'm, I can say this, the 21st century will not belong to schools that do not learn how to work together across disciplines. I can tell you that now, because all research is headed in an interdisciplinary place. So start small. It's going to take some faculty to make the decision to do it. Social scientists, now the question that also came up was social scientists don't, technology is changing really quickly and it's changing the nature of research. And social scientists may not be keeping up. That's true. It's not only true here, it's true all around the world. Political science, economics, all of the faculty now have to learn more about technology if they're going to do their research, period. They can't say, I don't want to learn it. If you don't want to learn it, you don't want to be a social scientist in the 21st century. That's the truth. It's somewhat generational. My generation, me, I'm too old for that. I leave it to the young people. They've got chat, TBT, they've got things that I couldn't even imagine. <laughs> That's why I say the future belongs to the young. But we have a responsibility. Those of us who are more mature, our responsibility is to guide and to point them in the right direction. So the students still have to mind their elders, even if they quietly say, we don't know all that we're talking about. We may not always understand the technology like they do because they're growing up with it in a way that we did not. But it's true that in order to do, this, to do social scientific work in the 21st century, social scientists will need to learn a bit more about how to use the technology. They don't have to understand it fully, because the truth is certain, some engineers don't fully understand the technologies. They're changing so quickly. Computer science is changing so quickly. Computer scientists are having problems keeping up with it at MIT. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, that's not, that's not unexpected. This stuff is changing very rapidly. But we have to try to keep up as best we can because that's where the world is headed. Learning how to, finding one's interest, even if you're a scientist, but you have interest in learning and art and such. 
you know, some of our students, many of our students, and I'm sure there are many budding entrepreneurs in this room, innovators. They want to be creative. They want to be. In, they want to innovate. You can't. Sometimes innovation and the ideas to become an innovator and creator don't happen in the lab. They happen through art. They happen through hearing great music. They happen through something else. The creative arts are important to scientists, if only to give you inspiration. But also, as we heard, I mean. Art, music are important parts of what it means to be human. No one wants to live with machines. I mean, you know, you can, you know, you have your phones, but really, that's not a per that's a phone. It's not a human being. Human beings connect through art and culture, writing, talking, music, all of the great things that make human cultures. And of course, here in Ghana, you have many rich cultures. So you wouldn't want to get rid of that. So the point is, is to find ways to nurture that even as you think about science and technology. Regarding the student who asked me, he was interested in innovation, was there any support for entrepreneurship? Well, you know, we always have support for entrepreneurship, but many of it's limited, to, of course, to our MIT students. So the, the goal is for all universities around the world and all governments to find ways to support young people in innovation. If, you want, if countries want innovators in nearly every country on the planet, wants that. We have to find ways to support our students. OK, so we will take our probably last batch of questions to be addressed. And I think we'll pick the first question from that side. So bright. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Maximilian Morimi, and I want to ask, um, there are some support systems for persons with disability here in KNUSD. But beyond that, is there any special support that the MIT give to persons with disability, and how does KNUSD collaborate in that regard? Thank you. Um, hi, um, thank you very much for coming to speak to us. It's quite inspirational for a lot of us because, well, MIT was, is a dream school for a lot of us here. So, um. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so in your presentation, you spoke on two main things that are I think are very important. First of all, research, how MIT is working to provide research opportunities for undergrad students. And the next thing you spoke about was on ethics and how you encourage your students to think about ethical development. So I think that, so my question is, you guys have been able to figure out how to give, expand access to research given that you've been able to systemically give opportunities to even undergrad students. From what I know, research slots are hard to get, and so it's, it's probably why our school doesn't have something that institutionalized for like everybody to. <laughs> well, if undergrad, um, can we, if can undergrad we research is institutionalized, can we please in have some silence? I did not know. My, so, so yeah, the question is, yes. given for ethical reasons, given that it's important to have democratized research, i.e. more voices in the room across the board, more diversity in research, so that you reduce biases against specific groups, how is MIT helping lesser privileged universities like KNUST to figure out, to figure out how to expand research opportunities across the board and include even undergrad students? Thank you very much. Shall we, shall we please have some silence? I, I really liked his opening. It's more like, me kopetiche biye di menye du mapape biya maye. So, can we have okay, our question? Good afternoon. My name is Isaac Sinsa Fajima, a second year student of English.
My question is, is there an opportunity for exchange program with the MIT and KN University, especially with the Department of English where I come from? In which department? Department of English. Of? English. English. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. okay, so please you go ahead. Okay, hello. Um, my, my name is Philip. Uh, please, could you emphasize on how MIT thrives on field work and lab work and more projects, and how MIT makes it possible for students to have and love those projects? Because, for example, like a seminar or a lecture like this, an order was given for us to come. So in order to help students love what we do, I think there should be avenues to help them enjoy the lab work, enjoy the field work, but it seems that it is not happening so much. So I want to ask how MIT does it, so students can enjoy the lab work, enjoy the field work, and not just done out of convenience, so that KNUC can also try and adopt the system. Okay, please go ahead. Uh, good evening, sorry. Uh, my name is Kelly Kwame Amuhai. I'm a second year mechanical engineering student. And in your lecture and in your answer of the questions, you highlighted on the importance of how technology such as engineers and scientists and the social scientists must work together in order to move the world forward. Now my question is, at MIT, you know, I'm sure you have achieved the same things, such as the technologists and the socialists working together. So what are the practical steps like the steps you use to achieve it. That way we can implement those same steps here in KNST. That way we can also move forward as a university. OK, so um, let us take our answers from Chancellor Nobles. OK, okay I'll take the last question first. Um, that is, uh, I talked a lot about, correct, at the end, the connection between engineers and social scientists and the importance of coming together. And um, I should say a couple of things. We're working on it. It's not complete. At MIT, I wouldn't call it a complete success. It's a work in progress. And part of the reason it's a work in progress is because we've got some pressures that have come to make it important. One of the pressures has come from some funding agencies the national, this is the government sponsored funding agencies, uh, the uh, National Science Foundation and other major foundations and government institutions and private foundations that support research, graduate level research. They have mandated in their proposals that you have some connection to social sciences, that you're doing something that's interdisciplinary. So that's a way of forcing researchers to think about it. Not all funding agencies are doing this, but it is an important part. So in other words, sometimes it has to come from outside. The force has to come from outside in order to make it happen, and it's tied to funding from the government. So that's one part, and also funding from private foundations. So that's outside of MIT. One of the things that we try to do within MIT, and I did this when I was the dean of the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, is that I did something very small, but it kind of worked out for some faculty members. I sponsored um, kind of small lunches or little get-togethers. There'd be some little bit of food, nothing big, something to drink, and invited faculty members who I knew, asked faculty members to organize themselves um, to get people together who had similar interests. They may not, let's say they were interested in, oh, I don't know, uh, cybersecurity or something. So uh, computer scientists who are working on how do you keep uh, digital information safe and social scientists and others who are concerned about surveillance and privacy. Get them in the room to talk about their research very briefly and to have conversations. Some of those things worked out because faculty began to know one another, work together, and then that would pass on to their students. So it's not a big uh, financial investment. It doesn't take money, it takes effort. 
And that was in an effort to figure out where there may be some lines of common lines of interest. As I mentioned, you, uh, I've heard this at nearly every university I've gone to speak, there is this issue of getting people to talk across disciplines. So you are not alone. This is what's happening in higher education. But you are also not alone in trying to think about how to fix it, because everyone recognizes that everyone has to do better on this. Uh, so that's what MIT has done, partly outside, partly inside pressures of forcing that. And also, finally, uh, big things that have happened in the world have required that disciplines work together. I talked earlier with the social scientists, and we talked a bit about COVID. So we all know COVID came. It was in the vaccine development was a huge scientific and technological achievement. But the vaccine didn't get out quickly. It didn't get out everywhere. And it didn't happen for reasons that had to do with logistics, social reasons people didn't trust it, not having the public infrastructure. All of those things are social and political and economic. They are not technological. So in order to deal with big challenges that we face today, you need to have social scientists and others in the room. That's just the way it is, if we want to do things to affect real human beings. How to enjoy lab work rather than enduring it. That's a comic, and MIT students complain about this too, in fact, so. But nearly some of the students feel that they have some, they're gaining something from this knowledge. Either A, they're going to learn something in the lab that will allow them to be a successful scientist when they leave. Some of them have ambitions of starting their own companies. So they find something in there that they can get for themselves. But some part of working in labs is just not fun. It's just not. So some part of it, and I think many people here of the older set will say you're paying your dues. There's some part of it that isn't fun. I, I know a big part of graduate school I didn't like. I just didn't like it. But I endured it in part because I, wanted, I, I, had, I knew I had to get the degree. But at the same time, it is important that the faculty and that we can create environments where people, students feel that they can learn and that their contributions are taken seriously and that they are seen as thinking, fun, you know, contributing to, to the effort. Research opportunities and exchange programs. MIT doesn't have a lot of exchange programs, but there are tons of research opportunities in two ways. One is, um, and it typically comes from uh, uh, faculty who, uh, that is at the institution apply, at MIT apply for seed funds, and they sometimes have relationships with faculty at other universities around the world. And that, those seeds funds, it's called the MISTI seed funds, global seed funds, has allows faculty from different universities to work together on a shared project. So that's one way that we have those opportunities. And to the degree that the faculty in turn have these opportunities, students who are working with those faculties have the chance to work on a research project. One of the ways that MIT tries to support less endowed universities in areas of research has been through online learning. So we have MIT X, uh, uh, where you can take classes online. Now, it is a fee. It's not free. Um, but it, we tried to make it somewhat affordable. Those classes students from around the world can take, and faculty can look to see how classes are being taught. It's online, you can access it, MITx. There's also something called the Khan Academy, which is completely free, and it was set up by an MIT alumni. And you can learn virtually every subject, from math, science, biology, writing, all of that. He's, it's, in fact, many high schools in the United States, public high schools and private high schools, the teachers in addition to teaching students, tell students, if you want more support, you want to learn more, go take classes at, or look at what's available at the Khan Academy. I myself have looked at the Khan Academy and read through some of the, gone through some of the lessons just to see how good it is. That's free. So if there's a concern that perhaps you're not getting what you want, and there's more that you want to learn, use the internet. One thing that COVID has taught us is that the world is big and the internet is a useful part of what we do. And I know that you have technologists here who are working more and more about energy efficiency and getting the grid going and the rest of it, so you'll have electricity. 
Finally, support for disabilities. Yes, we fully support MIT students who have disabilities. In fact, um, we've been recognized by the state of Massachusetts as being quite exceptional in our support of students. And you should know that students who apply to um, MIT, both as undergraduates, we admit students without regard to need. That includes international students. So any student who's accepted into MIT, we will make sure you can come independent of your family need. Not all universities do that. In fact, very, only seven the United States have the commitment that MIT has to funding our undergraduates, regardless of student need. That's it. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Ladies and gentlemen, shall we please applaud Chancellor Nobles? It's been an interactive session on the topic, the student at the heart of university education reflections from Chancellor Melissa Nobles of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, USA. It is my pleasure now to invite the chairperson for this occasion and the vice chancellor of KNUST, the registrar and the chairperson of the public lecture committee to do a presentation to the chancellor of MIT. Chancellor Melissa Nobles, this is from all of us here at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology to you. We have had a very, very fruitful interactive time with you. And uh, for us, the topic that you focused on, keeping the student in the center of education for higher institutions, for universities. And for me personally, what really resonated is what you said, that we need to guide the students to invent the future that we all want. And just listening to the questions that my dear brilliant students asked, I just know. <laughs> I, management, we are so convinced that we are on the right path. So thank you. We'll continue to work and improve. And thank you for also letting us understand that it is a collective responsibility. And that is what you are doing at MIT, and we will continue to do the same at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Thank you very much. So this is from us. From us to you, Chancellor Nobles. All right, then. There you go. <laughs> Apart from that, yes. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so, um, Chancellor Nobles, we just love to decorate the people we love. <laughs> so this is a unique KNUST scarf. And I'm going to just put it around your neck, if you permit me. Yes, of, course. of course. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much.
A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Chairperson, for this occasion, and Vice Chancellor of KNUSA, Professor Mrs. Rita Kusia Dixon. I would want to acknowledge the following people and also crave your indulgence for us to observe the following announcements, after which we will have our closing prayer and depart. I'd want to acknowledge the presence of Dan Sweeney, researcher at MIT, part of Melissa's team, and Amy Smith, also senior lecturer at MIT, who also came with Chancellor Nobles. Can we please see you wave at us? Thank you very much. I would want to acknowledge Amma Pokia Obain, lecturer at KSTU, who came here with 30 students from the Kumasi Technical University. Wherever you are, wave at us. All students from KSTU, thank you for coming. Mr. Michael Chuman Ampoma, Deputy Registrar, University Relations of Amstead, thank you very much for coming and joining us with your students. Mr. Donald Kwame Siedu, Senior Assistant Registrar of Amstead. Mr. Donald Kwame Siedu, okay. Ajwa Sewa Kankam, Senior Assistant Registrar, Amstead. Stephen Kwame, I'm a Senior Assistant Registrar, Amstead. Dr. Matilda Obin, Chair Assistant Registrar, Student Affairs of Amstead. The whole Amstead team, thank you very much for coming. I also acknowledge Akwisi. Ajiman, Senior Assistant Registrar Admissions, and uh, Jason Kobna Akon, Assistant Registrar Student Affairs, KSTU. Gaston Dafwe, Lecturer, GBUC. You also came here with 13 students of the Ghana Baptist University, Kali. Thank you very much all for coming. I want to bring to your attention that on the 3rd of August, we'll have our last inaugural lecture right here in the Great Hall to be delivered by another distinguished professor of KNUST, Professor Leonard Amekuji. He is the provost of the College of Science. Take notes and let's make it happen. There will be photographs and the uh, order is so simple. There will be um, a photograph of the speaker and management of KNUST, a photograph of the speaker and members of the public lecture committee of course, all of you students and Chancellor Nobles will take a photograph. And the last one will be Chancellor Nobles and myself. <laughs> I acknowledge our interpreter who has been here for quite some time doing all the good work. Thank you very much. Our last announcement will be in the form of a short video to be screened on the, um, by the projector, so let's have it. Our cherished and distinguished alumni and ever supportive stakeholders of our great university, the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Thank you very much for the privilege and the honor to come your way briefly with a few thoughts on the KNUST Day of Giving. This is a special day to honor, appreciate, and celebrate the hand that laid the golden eggs after 70 years of existence and global impact. On Friday, the 6th of October, 2023, we shall all show our appreciation to KNUST by making financial donations to the university towards a noble cause in an innovative online fundraising initiative that is dubbed the KNUST Day of Giving. Our target is to raise 200 million Ghana cities to build a 2,000 bed space hall of residence at KNUST to solve one of the biggest problems of our students and management, accommodation on campus for students. I am therefore calling on the magnanimity of all alumni, industry, and business partners, staff, students,
students and all friends of KNUSC to kindly make financial donations electronically in any major currency on the KNUSC Day of Giving. I am extremely pleased to announce to you that you are an automatic champion for this great and noble assignment. Please let us endeavor to rally as many people as possible to create this big supporting way to make a huge impact on this global KNUSD Day of Giving. No donation is too small. Thanks so very much and do stay blessed for deciding to give to support the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. KNUSD Day of Giving. Please do not be left out. Hashtag KNUSD Day of Giving. Thank you. Right, so ladies and gentlemen, that is it. On the 6th of October, 2023, we shall all show appreciation to KNUSC. The target is to raise 200 million Ghana cities to build that beautiful hall of residence for the benefit of you students so we improve on the accommodation challenges of the university. Don't be left out, as the vice chancellor said. And Chancellor Nobles, you came to KNUSC at the right time. You came at the time when this is actually running. <laughs> All our stakeholders are called upon to participate. And since you are here, we will not reject your offer of $1 million to it. Shall we please rise as I invite the Protestant chaplain to lead us with a closing prayer? Please let us pray. Our Lord and our Master, we continue to bless and honor your holy and mighty name for the gift of today. Indeed, you are the beginning and the end, the first and the last. We started this program in your name, acknowledging the fact that without you, we cannot do anything. We thank you, O oh God, for granting us the grace to enjoy a very successful afternoon, a time when there has been an exchange of ideas, exchange of information, exchange of knowledge, focusing on how we can place our students at the center of our existence as an institution of learning, formation, and education. We give you praise and honor for the facilitator, Chancellor Nobles, for the wisdom and the knowledge and the insight you accorded her to be such an instrument in your hands this afternoon. We pray that this cordiality and collaboration will continue and flourish so that it will inure to our benefit as institutions. As we are about to depart from here, we commend ourselves to you. Please be with us and carry us to the end of the day and we commit the rest of the activities ahead in this visit of Chancellor Nobles before you. Make it a blessing to us as KNUST and as MIT. We bless you for hearing our prayers because you have asked for this and many more blessings through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. So shall we please sit as we make arrangements for the order of photographs. So the Vice Chancellor Management and Chancellor Nobles, please climb up stage, yes, for the group photograph.
So pop. Hello. Public lecture committee be on standby. You are next. So public lecture committee and Chancellor Nobles.